I am taking live, sir. Now. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, Doctor Amol Power, sir. Uh, with your yeah. permission, shall we start? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Sure, sir. Good evening, doctors. This is Doctor Someshwar from Shield Healthcare. I welcome you on behalf of Shield. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar. I request all the participants to post their questions in the comment box so that at the end of the webinar we'll have a short Q&A session. So let me welcome today's our eminent speaker, Dr. A. Amol P. Powers, sir. It's a very honor, and we are very privileged to have you here, sir. And uh, sir, actually, doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he completed his uh, medicine from uh, Mumbai University in 2000, uh, and he completed his Ops and Gynecology MD from uh, Mumbai University, Seth GS Medical College, Mumbai, and uh, DGO in 2003, and uh, FCPS in 2004 from KM Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. And uh, he have uh, had a, um, registrations in uh, uh, Indian Medical Council, as well as a uh, he is currently employed with uh, as a associate professor in Ops and Gynecology with the Seth GS Medical College and Navarroshi Wadia Maternity Hospital, Mumbai, India. And uh, previously he worked as assistant professor, lecturer, and also as a MCH officer, uh, and also senior register. And also he had as a medical officer, and also he has uh, three years of residency scheme for MD in uh, Ops and Gynecology. At said GS Medical College and came group of hospitals, Mumbai. And also when coming to the honors and awards in MD, uh, he is a first ranker in subject in 2004. And also FCPS, uh, uh, he, he, he hold a first ranker. And also from uh, in, uh, he also write uh, scholarships uh, for a grand medical college. And uh, he has a uh, recognition of excellent work done in medical field awarded by the Municipal Corporation of Panchagani Satara 2001 and uh, Dr. N.A. Purandari Prize for Best Paper in Senior Category for Topic of Infectious Disease H1N1 in Pregnancy by uh, Mumbai Ops and Gynecology Society Annual Conference 2010. And coming to the publications, he has uh, three publications as a first author, uh, the Bombay Hospital Journal, and uh, seven publications as co author in national and international journals. And coming to the books, he is a co author, co -author for seven books. Yeah, with this, uh, we welcome you, sir, for uh, today's webinar. And thank you for giving your valuable uh, time. And uh, the current webinar is uh, streamed through the uh, Shield Connect, which is a digital platform to connect all the doctors at one place through webinars and scientific related information. Shield Connect strives to improve the state of the patient care, adapting to the modern day practices. So I request all the delegates to please do visit Shield Connect webpage to see all the webinars, blogs, and with this, uh, we are going to the today's topic. It is estimated that infertility affects 8 to 12 percent of couples globally. So with a male factor being a primary or contributing cause in approximately 50 percent of couples. So now without wasting much time. So let me turn over the time to Dr. Amul Pavasar to talk on molecular insights on male infertility. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Shield Pharma for giving me this opportunity to speak about something related to male infertility. Uh, even though it's a topic which uh, has two shades of cover, one from andrologist viewpoint and one from gynecologist viewpoint, every gynecologist must know some basic part of managing male infertility till the point that the uh, expertise required for male infertility go into the andrologist domain. So here are some molecular insights on male infertility. With your kind permission, I would like to start my presentation. So significant social and medical problem affecting couples worldwide is infertility. Average infertility is around 15% globally and varies in different populations. In some, the causes can be detected and treated, while others, there is something which constitutes like an unexplained infertility, which compromises around 10 to 20% of all cases. Infertility is the inability to conceive, 
after 12 months of having regular sexual intercourse with average frequency of two to three times a week without the use of any form of birth control. And in fertility due to impaired spermatogenesis, it, result, it may result from hypothalamic, pituitary or testicular disorders. The burden in the Indian scenario is something as follows. Male infertility accounts for around 40 to 50 percent of infertility burden, which affects 7 percent of all men. Normal zoospermia was observed in 35.80 percent, while oligozoospermia was observed in 34 percent. So, out of the total male infertility burden, if you only see the sperm analysis, the sperm analysis gives this varied presentation. So, even a normal zoospermia of 35 percent, that is one third of the cases, will be of normal sperm count. However, they may not be effective in giving rise to conception. So, how is the normal male reproductive access? As we know, the three levels of, high, uh, of coverage of hypothalamus, pituitary and testes are there. The hypothalamus secretes the GnRH. The GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone stimulates the pituitary to secrete in the male. Follicle stimulating hormone follicle stimulating hormone acts on the testes, it, sup it causes sperm, uh, suppression of the sperm inhibin, which gives rise to a positive feedback effect. This is affecting the seminiferous tubules. The luteinizing hormone affects the lydic cells. The lydic cells gives rise to the conversion form of alpha alpha reductase and dehydrogen testosterone. Now, this has a negative feedback effect on the pituitary and also on the hypothalamus. Infertility may result from one or more male or female factors. The female and male factors are equally responsible for infertility. However, in nearly 20% of the cases, both partners may be contributing for the cause of infertility. Hence, evaluation of both the partners and not only the female partner is essential to arrive at a diagnosis of the cause for infertility or sterility. Conditions that affect the quality and quantity of sperms may lead to infertility in the male. These may include varicocele, primary testicular failure, accessory gland infection, and idiopathic low sperm motility. Male hypogonadism. This is a condition in which the body doesn't produce enough hormone that plays a key role in masculine growth and development during puberty or enough for sperm or for both groups. So if we want to classify male hypogonadism, it forms into primary hypogonadism and secondary hypogonadism. Primary hypogonadism affecting particularly the end organ of testes. The secondary hypogonadism is as a result of problems related to hypothalamus and pituitary. The target organ androgen insensitivity or resistance is related to androgen receptor defects, 5-alpha reductase deficiency and aromatase deficiency. This is dehydrotestosterone and testosterone with estradiol affliction of the target tissue of the testes. So how would we classify male hypogonadism? Where there is no hypogonadism, the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary, the pituitary uh, stimulates uh, or gives rise to follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. These act on the testes, so normal testosterone is produced. Normal testosterone gives rise to normal sperm affliction. This is a normal hypothalamic pituitary testicular function. Now, in primary hypogonadism, the pituitary and hypothalamic secretions are present, the hypothalamus secretes normal amount of GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone. However, due to the affliction of the end organ called testes, there is low testosterone, there is testicular failure with increased amount of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. While if you see in the opposite side in secondary hypogonadism, the hypothalamus or the pituitary is affected. So there are low levels of luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone, which gives rise to low testosterone. So the primary affliction 
is of the hypothalamus and pituitary. There are two other types of complex male hypogonadism. These are the mixed and the compensated or subclinical. In mixed or the adult onset functional, there is low testosterone. There is combined testicular hypothalamic and pituitary failure leading to variable LH and FSH secretion. It may be more, it may be less, it is unpredictable. Now in compensated or subclinical hypogonadism, there is normal testosterone. However, there is an elevated luteinizing hormone secretion. There is also elevated sex hormone binding globulin secretion. So it leads to lower free testosterone, which is the actual active form of testosterone. This is predominantly associated with other physical symptoms, which can be seen on the male body. So most frequent causes of hypogonadism are isolated or idiopathic, hypogonadotropic, hypogonadism, pituitarism, Kleinfelter syndrome, and functional hypogonadism. This part of functional hypogonadism in today's age and era has caused a more prominent status. So you can have a primary, secondary, which we had discussed. The causes are testicular causes more in primary, mild descended ectopic testes, Kleinfelter syndrome, testicular tumor, orchitis secondary to mumps infection, congenital or acquired anarchia, testicular atrophy or dysgenesis. The secondary causes are either hypothalamic or they are pituitary causes. In hypothalamic, it may be idiopathic, Kalman syndrome, secondary gonadotropin releasing hormone deficiency, Prader-Willi syndrome. In the pituitary causes, these include hyperprolactinemia, hypopituitarism, and any pituitary tumors. A major cause is functional hypogonadism where there is no obvious hormonal defect which can be found out. Now, rarer causes include target organ resistance in which there is feminization due to androgen resistance or 5-alpha reductase deficiency, estrogen deficit due to aromatase deficiency or conversion deficiency. Clinical signs and symptoms in male hypogonadism Male hypogonadism is associated with wide range of symptoms and signs, some of which are more suggestive of hypogonadism than others. Now, classical signs and symptoms include reduced testicular volume, decreased body hair, gynecomastia, loss of vigor, decreased body mass and muscle strength, obesity, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, decreased bone mineral density, Mild anemia, other more prevalent sexual symptoms include reduced sexual desire and activity, erectile dysfunction, fewer and diminished nocturnal erections, cognitive and psychovegetative symptoms include hot flushes, changes in mood, fatigue, anger, sleep uh, disturbances, depression, and diminished cognitive function. A more Associated symptoms are the one highlighted include erectile dysfunction, gynecomastia, decrease in body mass and muscle strength, metabolic syndrome, and decreased bone mineral density. Now, these are the most common symptoms found with aging population. Other physical sign symptoms may not be necessarily present. However, Loss of body hair, abdominal obesity, and small testes may occasionally be seen. Obesity is the single most powerful predictor for low testosterone without even evaluation of the testosterone level. Other metabolic problems which may be associated with male hypogonadism are the lipid profile which may be altered, impaired glucose metabolism, increased total body fat, osteopenia, osteoporosis, and reduction in red cell volume. How would you diagnose male hypogonadism? Diagnosis of male hypogonadism is based on persistent signs and symptoms of androgen deficiency plus consistently low serum testosterone concentration. Assessment of the uh, testosterone should also be considered named with underlying condition who have received treatment that are commonly associated with 
male hypogonadism. Now, to testosterone deficiency may be seen in type 2 uh, diabetes mellitus, obesity, pituitary mass following radiation, moderate or severe COPD, osteoporosis, HIV infection with sarcopenia, treatment with other medications like corticosteroids and opiates. Now, there is no defined cutoff levels for testosterone. Now, these depend upon each country and each type of uh, societies who have formed, uh, who define the normality levels. Now, the testosterone deficiency syndrome, there is usually a general range of agreement on it. Now, testosterone deficiency syndrome is likely when the total testosterone is less than 8 nanomoles per liter and the free testosterone is less than 180 picomoles per liter. Now, if there is a level which is more than 12 nanomoles per liter and free testosterone, which is significantly above 225 picomoles per liter, it is less likely to be a testosterone deficiency syndrome. And as a result of which, one may consider a treatment change from testosterone therapy to non-testosterone therapy. Now, biochemical examination of adult men with suspected hypogonadism should include the following hormones. Testosterone is necessary to reveal the endocrine activity of actually the end organ testes. The luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone are indicators of pituitary function and also help in assessment of the gonadotrop hypogonadism. Increased gonadotropins indicate primary hypogonadism. That implies a raised LH and FSH level. A decreased gonadotropin in combination with decreased testosterone suggests a secondary hypogonadism. That means a widespread pituitary and end organ failure. Other hormonal assays and baseline tests may include a sex hormone binding globulin, hematocrit and lipid profile to diagnose a metabolic syndrome wherein the end organ along with other hormonal deficiency may be present. Now, what would be a form of the treatment? Now, in a primary hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, whether GnRH pulse therapy would be effective or a human menopausal gonadotropin would be effective. When you compare it with a female uh, type of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, usually treatment with human menopausal gonadotropin or HCG is quite effective. However, in case of male hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, it is the pulse therapy with gonadotropins releasing hormone which gives rise to effective treatment therapy. If you see on the y-axis, the sperm appearance occurs within four and a half to five months with pulse GnRH analog therapy. However, it takes double nearly the time, seven and a half months to eight months for uh, effect to arise with HSG, HMG group. Hence, it is essential that a good endocrinologist treatment should be undertaken with pulse GnRH therapy when you have diagnosed a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in males. Clomiphene and antioxidants are useful in idiopathic oligozoospermia. Now, if you see this study which was present, and six months of therapy with clomiphene citrate with vitamin E gave comparable results and good outcomes in the case where there is idiopathic hypogonadism. There is a new concept. Of course, it is not a new concept. It has been there from the last three decades or so of reactive oxygen species damage leading to abnormal sperm counts and abnormal sperm motilities. Now, what are reactive oxygen sperms? These are the ones which affect environmental lifestyle factors, which leads to oxidative stress, H2O2 and hydroxide with free radical oxygen. Drugs, smoking, pollution, radiation, including systemic pathologies like diabetes, cancer and systemic 
infection. These cause oxidative stress on the spermatids, leading to spermatozoal dysfunction, following which infertility occurs. Evaluation for oxidative stress is something which is essential in history and treatment of underlying pathology with antioxidant supplementation is the one which forms the treatment for such type of male infertility. Now, what are reactive oxygen species? These give rise to uh, depletion of sperm antioxidants. Physiologically, the spermatozoa have low antioxidant capacity and for this reason, they re get easily affected by reactive oxygen species. Now, this oxidin, oxidative stress marker of DNA damage and apoptosis of the spermatozoa. So, when immature and abnormal spermatozoal cells are present in large numbers, now that is the evaluation indirectly to determine reactive oxygen species damage to spermatogenesis. Now, in this case, DNA fragmentation tests are also available, which can give an indicator of the kind of infertility as a result of oxidative stress damage. Now, impact of ROS on motility, morphology, and DNA stability. These reactive oxygen species induce changes in the mitochondrial membrane and compromise sperm function. The mitochondrial membrane potential and levels of ROS are inversely co correlated. Spermatozoa have very low DNA repair mechanism and as a result of which fragmented sperms are in higher in number. This also leads to repetitive bad obstetric history of early pregnancy losses. So, something about the molecular mechanism of antioxidant supplementation. Antioxidant supplementation in idiopathic infertile men have beneficial effect on sperm function proteins associated with fertility at molecular level. Particular proteins involved in serum signaling, mitochondrial function and protein oxidation. Now, these may be present and this may help in reversing the oxidative stress damage which have been occurred on the sperm and spermatids. Now, these are the uh, antioxidant, post antioxidant signaling values which are seen, which improve sperm function. So, antioxidants work at different levels mitochondria, energy metabolism, ROS release. This works as an anti to the ROS release or reactive oxidative stress, which are known to cause DNA damage, abortive apoptosis, apoptosis, decrease functionality. So this is overall helpful for healing of the spermatids. Current evidence links oxidative stress to male infertility, reduce sperm motility, sperm DNA damage, and increase risk of recurrent abortions, including genetic disease. Oxidative stress is detrimental, detrimental to fertility, pregnancy, and genetic status of the newborn. So, certain opinions on drug metabolism and toxicology have found that oxidative stress affects negatively the testicular microenvironment and ends up causing a deficient spermatogenesis, damages the sperm DNA, as well as reduces its motility and morphology. Antioxidants for protection to help the sperm function, particularly in case of idiopathic infertility. Please note that idiopathic infertility is a fast rising cause for generalized male causes of infertility, which can be easily dealt with by constant supplementation with antioxidants. These molecules are free radical scavengers and protect the spermatozoa by counteracting the lipid membrane peroxidation protein corruption and DNA fragmentation. So this is a pictorial representation of the intrinsic stress defect, extrinsic stress of infection, radiation, chemotherapy and pollution. Three of the antioxidants which are very common are free radical oxygen, hydrogen peroxide and hydroxide which are known to cause these damages. So what are the known and unknown 
treatment formulations with active ingredients. Levocarnitin has been evolved from a lot of energy substrate for the spermatozoa. They also are involved with maturation of the sperm and it is essential for the transport of fatty acid into the mitochondria. Low level, levels of levocarnitin reduces the fatty acid concentration within the mitochondria, reduce, causing decreased sperm motility. OQ10, it is another vital antioxidant omnipresent in almost all body tissues. It is particularly present in high concentration in the sperm mitochondria with essentially for cellular respiration and energy production. A significant negative correlation between OQ10 levels and hydrogen peroxides have been reported. So one of the major stress factors, hydrogen peroxide behaves inversely with the levels of OQ10. Now levels in seminal plasma, sperm count and motility were detected with increasing OQ10 levels. Selenium, it is a trace element which is involved in spermatogenesis and thought to stem from its ability to protect the sperm DNA against oxidative stress damage. It's also more than a major constituent of a specific group of proteins called selenoenzymes. Now, these things together help maintain the sperm structural integrity. Selenium deficiency has been most commonly associated with morphological sperm middle piece abnormalities and impaired of sperm motility. Zinc, of course, with COVID time, zinc has become a prominent treatment modality. It is an essential trace element. The role in DNA and RNA metabolism is very, very predominant. Okay. It is an antioxidant, decreases production of hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen hydroxyl radicals. Zinc concentration in seminal fluid of fertile men is significantly higher. It has a protective mechanism against sperm abnormalities, including hypertrophy, hyperplasia of fibrous sheet. Lycopene is a bright red pigment and phytochemical form in red colored vegetables like tomatoes, red fruits, watermelons, and guavas. It belongs to carotenoid level and it is also synthesized by plants. Lycopene is powerful radical oxygen stress quenching ability makes it a major contributor for human redox defense. Lycopene is detected in high concentration in human testes and seminal plasma with levels that tend to be lower in infertile men. There have been a number of papers which have been put forward for the treatment of oligospermia with amine, essential amino acid and arginine. Okay. Severe oligospermia before treatment and after treatment and severe oligospermia and mild oligospermia. The changes are more than obvious. Before and after therapy of arginine, after therapy you can see the spermatozoa count being improved. Biological process in spermatogenesis. The fertilization aptness of the spermatozoa depends upon appropriate time dependent acquisition of three important biological processes: capacitation and hypermotility, chemotaxis and acrosome reaction. Now, all these three are essential for basically after ejaculation the sperms being effective and effective. So in this case, this three biological process depend upon the calcium ion oscillation. Now, what is calcium ion oscillation? The fertilization aptness of the spermatozoa depends on the appropriate and time dependent acquisition, hemotaxis, capacitation, and of course the final dissolution called an acrosome reaction where calcium is extensively involved in each step. Calcium signaling events which mediate these things are essential. Myoinositol is the major factor which on which calcium ion oscillation is dependent upon.
myoinositol and male reproduction myoinositol concentration is significantly higher in the seminiferous tubules than in the serum myoinositol is involved in the process that include regulation of motility capacitation and acrosome reaction of sperm cells it is high values indicate the integrity of the structure with optimal levels of activity and are associated with high cell viability these are some of the papers wherein the effect of myoinositol on sperm mitochondrial function are seen it is also directly increases the mitochondrial membrane potential that is an apoptotic marker in the sperm cells so some of the double randomized placebo controlled studies have also shown a good effect in idiopathic infertility on the use of myoinositol sperm dna fragmentation single stranded dna breaking double stranded dna breaking base deletion and inter and intra strand cross linkages have been seen now this dna fragmentation leads to immotility in the sperm as much as in 60% of the cases <clears throat> finally coming to a certain interesting topic of this presentation where how covid-19 infection has impacted in sperm count uh, sperm motility and basically male infertility the male infected um, fertility and the covid-19 pandemic the probable mechanism by which the sars cov-2 might affect spermatogenesis are summarized due to the ace inhibitors or the angiotensin converting enzyme so there is direct destruction of these ace2 inhibitors uh, receptors leading to impaired spermatogenesis decrease intratesticular testosterone levels so these are the probable effects which we are will be seeing for a long time with covid infection sexual transmission primarily 5% of men with active disease or in convalescent may may be showing semen samples with sars cov2 virus in the semen sample natural pregnancy the impact of sars cov2 on pregnancy appears to be less severe than other corona however preterm delivery and low fetal birth are among the most common implications of covid-19 infection in assisted reproductive techniques pandemic when after control, uh, you may consider art treatment only after incorporating risk assessment and mitigating strategies and when measures to maximize the safety of the patient and staff have been employed cryo preservation may present a major risk for cross contamination during the cryo preservation so it has impacted natural pregnancy art and cryo preservation <clears throat> so what about the sperm count and sperm motility now if you see uh, basically the types of uh, infections which are there so in those case the moderate covid infection has affected significantly the motility and also the count of the sperms in male candidates while a mild covid-19 infection has not by far affected anything in male uh, candidates however moderate we have not yet had studies of severe covid infections and with re relation to visa vis sperm concentration and motility however moderates have by far affected significantly the count and the motility in this case in the i think it is within the 3 months of the covid infection so strengths weakness and opportunities including threat analysis have been conducted so what do we find in that more research should be conducted to clarify the effect of sars cov on male and female reproduction and reproductive capacities uh, it seems to be it is less than sars or mers 
However, more studies would be required in order to define its clear effect on long-term basis. To summarize this presentation, male factors are responsible to nearly half of all the causes for infertility and the rate of which has been increasing at an alarming level, more so due to external factors and more so due to the radical oxygen damage. Low myoinositol levels within the epididymis and seminal fluids are associated with infertility. Myoinositol has definite beneficial e effect on motility, fertilization capacity, embryo quality, especially in patients undergoing IVF. So we don't see why it should not help in natural conception. Current evidence links oxidative stress to male infertilities, reduced sperm motility, sperm DNA damage, and increased risk of recurrent abortions with genetic disease. Antioxidants are free radical scavengers, and they are extremely helpful in stabilizing the lipid membrane. Also, protein corruption works against protein corruption and DNA fragmentation. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It's always yeah. an honor and learning to hear you, sir. Uh, sir, if you allow, then we'll uh, take the questions from the... Sure. Yes. If there are any questions, there will be more than happy. Uh, Dr. Anubha Singh saying, uh, nice presentation. Uh, we have a question, sir. Uh, can I yeah. see the question? Oh, I mean, that is in the other window, sir. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, when to consider testicular biopsy? Sorry? When to consider testicular biopsy? Testicular biopsy may be considered where there is a cause or a suspicion for testicular failure. In uh, raised follicle stimulating hormone, uh, one may consider for a testicular biopsy. Also, one may consider for a testicular biopsy when there is an abnormal decrease in the size of testes with previous normal testicular sizes and previous normal semen counts which are present. A testicular biopsy is obviously an invasive procedure. Non-invasive procedures like ultrasound of the testes with Doppler flow of the testicular would be the primary means followed with testicular biopsy. Usually, testicular biopsies are combined with TESA procedures where spermatids may be aspirated and grown in the lab to form uh, spermatid cultures to find out whether there is any secondary growth arrest which can be corrected using TESA procedures. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have one more question, sir. Uh, Astenozoospermia, leukospermia, and uh, previous IVF failure. What is the approach? Um, <coughs> sorry, I could not get you properly. Yeah, uh, Astenozoospermia, sir. Astenozoospermia. Yeah, leukospermia. Mm -hmm. uh, with one IVF cycle failure. So, what is the approach? Now, the problem with uh, one IVF. Uh, Failure is something which requires more evaluation from the point of view of what sperms or gametes were used. As far as why knowledge goes into the case of infertility, uh, it would require maybe a donor gamete if this is the recurrent problem and not correctable problem. A donor gamete would be an answer to that. Thank you very much, sir. So I don't find any uh, questions from the delegates. Yeah. So if uh, there are any further questions, definitely we'll pass it on to you. Sure. My lady, sir. Sure, yeah. sure. Thank you very much, sir, for giving your valuable Thank talk you and much. valuable time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And Thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, sir. And many thanks yeah. from the SHIELD team. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, sir. And I also thank all the delegates who are participating in this webinar. And if you missed any part of this webinar, it will be available in the Shield Connect webpage, as well as in the Shield Connect page in the YouTube as well.
thank you very much thank you. Have, a, yeah. Yeah. have a good day